The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And there was a flood of op applications, so how is there still money left over? The San Antonio City Council awarded tens of millions of dollars today as part of its ongoing plan to use the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, money. That money awarded today was for mental health, youth, seniors, and some nonprofits. Garrett Berger tells us why the full amount wasn't given out. Dozens of groups applied for the money and dozens showed up to speak before City Council approved the list today of who'd get it. Some showing gratitude. We thank you for making children in care a priority with the ARPA funding. Others asking for another look. I think you should reconsider uh, what I bring to the table. There was more than 40 million set aside for mental health, youth, seniors and nonprofits. But city staff's recommendations for awarding it still left 3.7 million on the table mostly in the mental health category. Even though there were $109 million worth of requests left unfunded across the board. It's not about good or bad, um, but there just were some proposals that didn't address what we had asked them to address. The funds had been set aside for specific purposes within the four categories. And the city says some of the requests either didn't meet the scope or didn't score high enough, or there just wasn't enough money in that particular bucket. The leftover money isn't gone. It's just going back to city council committees. We'll decide how they want to spend it next. I don't doubt that we're going to be back here uh, in maybe four weeks or so, and we're going to have the same conversation about disappointment that some organizations are not being funded because the list is long. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Five hours of deliberations and a jury is still not decided the fate of Andre McDonald. McDonald accused of the 2019 murder of his wife, Andrea. Erica Hernandez joining us live now with the very latest on this. You've been watching it, it all afternoon, Erica. So was there any expectation it was going to take the jury this long? You know, Myra, we never can really expect what the jury is going to do as each trial is so different. But I can say the jury in this case is really looking at all the possibilities as they've been taking this long in this case. Now, as far as those possible outcomes, those outcomes could be, of course, not guilty or guilty of murder or guilty of the lesser charge, which is manslaughter. Earlier today, both sides gave their closing arguments. Here's a little of what was said. This is not self-defense. This is a cover-up. He admitted he lied to everyone. He lied to his friends, the police, Lieutenant Colonel Chatlin, everyone about what he had done. Andre McDonald did not intentionally or knowingly murder Andrew McDonald. Whether he was reckless is for you to decide. Now, we did hear from the jury a little while ago. They had a question for the judge about the charge. But if a decision is not made within the next hour, we're being told that the judge could have them come back tomorrow to resume deliberations. It's still unclear if they would be sequestered or not. Make sure you stay with Case at 12 as we will have that verdict for you. We'll be streaming it live on all our platforms. Steve Myra. All right, thank you, Erica. A one-year-old girl found safe today after an Amber Alert. According to SAPD, Aviani Brown was found around 1030 this morning. The little girl was last seen around 1 a.m. this morning on the northeast side. DPS named 20-year-old Jayshawn Brown as the person they believed took Aviani. Details regarding how she was found, though, have not been released. Jayshawn Brown was detained for questioning. San Antonio police say a man admits to killing another man, saying it was self-defense. But police say the evidence suggests it was murder. 24-year-old Cameron Hunter Johns is charged with murder in connection to the death of a man on January 15th. The identity of that man has not been released. According to an arrest affidavit, Johns told police he and the victim were arguing when the victim pulled a machete on him. John says he shot him twice. The report says a witness later contacted SAPD and told them Johns did not shoot in self-defense and claims he staged the crime scene by placing a machete in the victim's hands, then allegedly shooting the victim again. Afterwards, Johns reportedly went to a Wendy's to eat before going to the jail to flag down an officer. His bond is set at a quarter of a million dollars. 
People living in parts of the Hill Country, other areas to the north without power overnight and into this afternoon. Now the power is coming back on, but crews are still working overtime. CPS Energy restored power to the city of Fair Oaks Ranch near Bernie today. Even though the power is flowing again, though, crews are working line by line to repair the damage caused by this weather. Meanwhile, people living in Bull Verde and Spring Branch, they're still without electricity. Crews are up against thawing ice and struggling to get their equipment through some mud in those areas. We checked on neighbors and some businesses like a hotel that has seen countless cancellations. We're giving people flashlights. Um, we actually cooked breakfast on our grill out back this morning. You want to be back in the warmth and it makes you resourceful, but you want your power back. A lot of people do. The Perdinalis Electric Cooperative says it is unclear when power will be restored because the damage is extensive. Right now, some residents in New Braunfels under a boil water notice after a power outage caused a loss of water pressure there. New Braunfels Utilities says the notice is for its customers in the River Chase pressure zone. The utility says low water pressure could create a breeding ground for harmful bacteria. Residents in that area being instructed to boil all water that will be used for drinking or for things like washing your hands or brushing your teeth. NBU has not said how long it may take to restore water pressure to normal. A fire this morning at a downtown apartment had residents grabbing what they could and making a mad dash to the door to escape. Now fire investigators are sorting through the ashes left to try to figure out how this fire started. This happened on West Magnolia near San Pedro Avenue. Katrina Weber tells us why one woman says she's surprised that she made it out safely. With more than a dozen fire trucks flooding into the 400 block of West Magnolia, there was no sleeping in for anyone in the area. Fire broke out inside a ground floor apartment of this building just before 7 this morning. Monica Sutton is glad she already was awake. Uh, we were watching the show and it ended and we just happened to notice the sound. And so my hubby ran out to go see what was going on and then started screaming, wake up, get up, get up. She says the sight he saw down the hall was fire and the sound was the smoke detector, but coming from a different apartment. There's supposed to be one above my bedroom door, one outside my bedroom door, and somewhere by the front door, and there isn't one. Sutton says she feels like luck was on her side. She escaped along with her husband, service dog, and a neighbor's pet. Firefighters say another adult and infant who live in the building also made it out safely. They say the apartment where the fire broke out was tough for crews to navigate. Uh, at this point, we, we don't know. There's too much stuff in there. They're having to go through too many layers of, of debris. One woman who lives here told me that because this building is so old, she was worried about the fire quickly spreading. But firefighters say that wasn't the case. They kept it to just that one unit. It didn't extend up to the second floor. It didn't go into the attic space, anything like that. During the fire, CPS Energy had to cut electricity to the building. But firefighters say once the power is back on, most people here should be able to go back home soon. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. Fortunately, today, not a lot of problems as we've seen over the last couple of days. The weather clearing up, but US 90 and military here. You can see at least two cars there with their flashing lights on off to the shoulder, possibly a fender bender in that area. Doesn't look like it's tying things up at all from this angle and fortunately things a lot drier out on the roads today. A lot drier and boy are we ready for a warm up live cam outside and you know I was hoping for maybe a little more sun today. We got a little taste of a it. A little. A little peak. Tomorrow maybe more. Adam? Oh, a lot more tomorrow. Yes, 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 yes. It's going to be much better and you can tell who across the state actually had some sunshine. Panhandle, West Texas, and even just west of San Antonio. Temperatures were well into the 50s, but underneath the clouds, we were talking 40s for highs. 42 the high in Gonzales. Meanwhile, nearly 60 in Carrizo Springs with the sunshine. Rock Springs under the clouds made it to 41, but neighboring Del Rio, 56, because that's where we had a little pocket of clearing. Right now we're 43 in San Antonio, Kerrville down to 42, 40 in Bulverde, 42 Converse, above freezing. All the limbs, trees, and power lines have had a chance to thaw out, which is a good thing, because we're gonna feel the chill tonight. 
37 at 10 o'clock. By midnight, we're down to 36. And then tomorrow morning, I am anticipating a freeze. A few degrees below freezing, Bernie, Fair Oaks Ranch, Bulverde, points northward into the hill country, and even west of town, Rio Medina, Castroville, Divine. Just a brief light freeze tomorrow morning, but clear sky, no moisture, no icing, no precipitation. More intriguing pictures and videos from the icing, along with our next chance of rain and how warm it's going to get in just a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. New at six, we first told you about Christina Pacheco back in December. She is the Pleasanton wife and mother who had both her hands and her feet amputated shortly after giving birth. She's an inspiration. Our RJ Marquez caught up with Christi Christina's husband, Jacob, who tells us his wife is getting stronger by the day and reveals what's next in her recovery. It's an emotional and physical daily struggle, but Christina Pacheco is up to the challenge. She's really, really strong. She's definitely, she's kicking the rehab butt for sure. Pacheco is now in Houston, continuing her rehab after nearly losing her life after giving birth because of an infection. That infection caused her to lose her hands and feet in late October. Waiting for the healing process to happen on her legs, but her arms are doing really, really well. Um, and hopefully soon we'll be uh, starting uh, the prosthetic um, training. Pacheco says his wife goes through hours of rehab a day with the goal to get back to their two young children, a two and a half year old son and a three month old daughter. Her little boy is helping her get through some of the long days. The best medicine she's going to have is going home and being with the kids. Um, and that's been her mindset, just getting home to the kids and loving the babies. The Pleasanton Community and School District held a huge fundraiser for the family three weeks ago. Jacob says the love and support from all over the country has been overwhelming. It brought us to tears, really, just that, that feeling. You know, me and my wife cried about it and just happy tears of how supportive and how much the community uh, does for us. Jacob says his wife is a fighter and ready for the next step in her recovery. Just to see the absolute strength come from my wife, you know, I knew she had it in her. Just super proud of, you know, to be called her husband. Christina is scheduled to be released from that rehab center in Houston on February 11th. The Pachecos then hope they can return home for good and continue her treatment at the Center for the Intrepid at BAMSI. RG Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Still wishing Christina all the best. Still to come here at six, it is a first out of Joint Base San Antonio Lackland as we celebrate Black History Month, an all black, all female team. They are breaking barriers. We're going to share their story up next. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. But we don't have electricity or anything, we don't have any warming in the house, so we had was coated up pretty well. Yeah, imagine this, no power for more than 24 hours. That's how it's been for that family. What they're doing to stay warm as they wait for the lights to turn back on. A barely passing score leads to a suspended license for one San Antonio restaurant. The changes that are required to reverse that decision and how other restaurants fared with the health inspector when we go behind the kitchen door. It's tonight on the Night Beat. We'll see you then. Black History Month often looks to the past, celebrating the accomplishments of so many people. But today, Joint Base San Antonio is celebrating those who are making history as we speak. Our Jonathan Cotto has the story. Being a black woman in the military or a woman of color at all in a position where we are leading and we are taking charge is super important. Hey! For the first time, an all-female, all-black commander of airmen team at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland. Selected based off their qualifications and experience to lead a graduation ceremony. I think it's super powerful. I've never seen it. I've been here about a year and a half, and I haven't seen a COA team that was even all female. Tech Sergeant Stringfeld says representation matters. Some of the families made comments as we watched by that they were proud to see us, and they were excited. Sir, I present the command. The commander of airmen, Sergeant Sabrina Martin. She says there is power not only in representation, 
but also visibility. Sometimes our hard work going unnoticed, so it's good to sometimes when you walk through that bomb run, just to stretch yourself, let them know like I am here and we are amazing. Martin says it's important to assume roles of leadership, setting the standard. I would say we're taking over. <laughs> the women, the women um, definitely African-American women, I feel like we're getting into those positions that make a difference and as well as being that role model um, for those that are upcoming. Sergeant Latasha Ross says she understands the role she plays in shaping the future of the Air Force and encourages others to dream as big as possible. I go into situations and I'm just like, hey, I'm here and I'm going to be in the room. Uh, that's how my, my parents taught me from when I was young. Ross says today's presence was definitely seen, heard and felt. Everybody's just very excited about it, regardless of their skin color. And that shows diversity to me. That shows that it's it's reaching other people and they see it and they acknowledge it and they support it. Jonathan Cotto, Keyset 12 News. Great example. Yeah. Right there. All right. Sure. It is 42 degrees outside. Normally, you know, 42 is a little chilly. <laughs> Not today. Yeah. Nice and balmy out there. <laughs> Normally, we'd be complaining right now. Yeah. 42 has never felt so amazing as it did today. And it even felt a little chilly because we didn't have that good sunshine beating down on us, at least not in San Antonio and not in the hill country. But as I showed you earlier, some locations off to the west did have some sun and we're fortunate. Temperatures only go up from here. 58 for the high tomorrow, 64 on Saturday. By Sunday, we're into the 70s and Monday. We're up to 77. I mean, flirting with 80 degrees at that point. How about that? All right, let's take a look at uh, what we're still dealing with in parts of our area. This was earlier this morning. Now, the heavy weight of the ice overnight, even though we didn't add additional ice, the prolonged stress on the trees caused more damage off to the north, north of 1604. This is the Bernie area. Some beautiful sights, you got to admit, it's not often you see a prickly pear looking like that. Uh, but unfortunately, there are some of the limbs that continue to break and fall and that big, big oak in Timberwood Park, along with Spring Branch. And here's the key underneath. It says trees continue to fall under the weight of the ice. That was this morning that ice has melted off. It's going to be cold tonight, but not problematic. That's interesting there too on the uh, flag post for the uh, for the green at the golf course. OK, so that's what we we're dealing with going ahead here. Chilly, but clear and dry tonight. So no issues out there. If the roads are dry, they're going to stay that way. A sunny stretch ahead. That sunshine is going to go a long way, even just psychologically. Even if you're cleaning up some of those downed limbs or you don't have power, that sun's going to give you a good boost tomorrow and really through the weekend. Next chance of rain comes next week by Tuesday and Wednesday. Let's talk about the overall pattern and what's changing. There's all of our precipitation now headed into the southeastern U.S. Louisiana, eastward Mississippi, Alabama, on into Georgia as well. Some little bits of rain left over from Waco up to Dallas, but warm enough to just be rain. Liquid variety, no freezing on contact there. Here's the trough, the dip in the upper level flow. Remember a few days ago we were telling you that was down over Southern California? Well, now it has pushed eastward. That axis, that trough axis is behind us and moving through and we'll be on the back side of that, and that means clearing even pretty quickly, I think, later on this evening and tonight. Now, this little bump in the upper level flow, that's a little ridge, a little blue H, that's going to be settling in briefly tomorrow, and that's going to spell a lot of sunshine through the day tomorrow. And even this weekend, we'll have a lot of sun as well, a fairly tranquil pattern. Then by Sunday, we're going to be watching the West Coast because another trough, another dip, disturbance in the upper level flow will be moving into the western U.S., that's going to track farther to the south, likely dig down into the four corner states, maybe even northern Mexico. If that holds true and is the case, it's going to increase our rain chances a bit. Still a bit of uncertainty with this system on exactly where it's going to put itself, but the farther south it goes, the higher our rain chances will be. So right now we have those rain chances at 30 percent, even thunderstorms really for Tuesday and Wednesday and temperature near 70. OK, so not. No, no icing involved there, uh, but there is the possibility we'll be increasing those chances once we get uh, closer to that and really just over the next couple of days. Tomorrow morning, we talked about this earlier, light freeze north of 1604 and even west of 1604, Medina County, Uvalde County, Bandera, 
and up into the hill country just a little below freezing in the morning. Could be some areas of freezing fog on some elevated surfaces, but probably unlikely. By 7 a.m. in town, we're up to 35 degrees. By 4 p.m., we're up to 58 and sunny. Even 60 degrees in Castroville tomorrow. Sabinal up to 62. Then come the 70s by Sunday and even into next week with those rain chances. No ice, no ice. Maybe <laughs> just some rumbles of thunder, though. All right, bring on the sunshine. Thank you, Adam. All right, bring on the pens and paper, too, because it is <laughs> signing day for a lot of high schoolers. Yeah, we had a couple of schools for you at 5 o'clock. Now we're going to show you the rest of the schools we were able to stop by today. Reagan High School, Steele High School, and Incarnate Word High School. Plus, Zeke will need to take a pay cut if he wants to stay with the Cowboys. Coming up. Continue our national signing day coverage at Reagan High School, where at least 17 student athletes committed to continue their academic and athletic career at the next level. Kayla Beach is going to the U.S. Air Force Academy for track and field. Football player Giuseppe Sessi is going to the U.S. Naval Academy. And Marlo Zamora is heading to Trinity University for golf, just to name a few. It's a dream come true. It's everything I dreamt about since I was a kid, playing big time college football and um, getting a great education out of it. Um, you know, it, it's it's really a thank you to my parents um, for everything that they've done for me. And so I'm just so grateful to be in this position. The one thing that's really unique about Trinity that's different from other schools is they're also really competitive in golf. And that's really amazing to see that you won't be able to like, sac you don't have to sacrifice your education and still play a college sport. Take you to Still High School for another big list of signees with 12 student athletes putting pen to paper and taking pictures with family and friends to commemorate the day. Addison James will continue her basketball career and education in Nichols State. Makai Williams is heading to Tulane for football and Christian Fitchett will attend UIW to play football for the Cardinals. Growing up for the past four years at Steele and seeing the people before me just sign and go to these big schools, man, it's, it's inspiring. You know what I mean? And to be the next man up and hopefully inspire younger kids after me, generation continues to flourish. Um, it's very exciting. I mean, I worked my whole life for this and it's very rewarding to be able to, to go somewhere where I want to go and just do the thing I love. It's a great opportunity. I love that I'm having this opportunity to come here and play on kind of work and continue my education. We end at Incarnate Word High School where Juliana De Luna will take her softball skills to Emporia State University. Micah Raby will attend Shriner University to play golf and Sophia Silva will tee it up at the University of New Haven. Raby and Silva are golf team co-captains for the Shamrocks. I honestly had no idea about the school at all until I went to the camp um, in la it was last August and then I went up for my visit a couple months later and the second I was there for the camp, I knew that was where I wanted to be. I felt at home there. Um, it is my favorite color, so that was a little, a little kick. But I just, the campus is gorgeous. I love that it's a little smaller. I've been in private school my whole life, so I really wasn't looking at going to a big campus. It was kind of hard finding a school that um, had what I wanted to do academically as well as athletically. It was one of them I reached out, they reached back to me, so it was, um, it was a good choice. In case you missed it, we aired Sam Houston and Brandeis High Schools at 5 p.m. We'll have more on National Signing Day on the sports page at KSAT.com. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Lawford. The Dallas Cowboys want to keep running backs Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard. Pollard is 25 and scheduled to become a free agent. Zeke, on the other hand, is 27 and due to make $10.9 million in base salary next season. But he doesn't have any guaranteed money left. Zeke said he'd take a pay cut to stay, which is probably going to happen. You got to look at uh, Zeke, and then obviously Tony's looking to make more money. So no one respects him more than our football team, the players on the team. It's just, a, you know, sometimes it's a hard business, and we're going to have to have some. And I think he knows that. I think I've seen him quoted. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have to talk business. And that means take less money, Zeke. You have to talk <laughs> business. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. All right. Still to come here at. The questions keep coming for New York Congressman George Santos, how his alleged fundraising efforts for a veteran's charity has now sparked an FBI investigation.
News across America now. The FBI officially opening a probe into embattled New York Congressman George Santos's alleged involvement in a fundraising scheme. A disabled Navy veteran accused Santos of stealing money raised on a GoFundMe page that was meant to help his dying service dog. ABC's M. Wen has the latest on Santos denying allegations and refusing to leave office despite a growing number of calls to resign. FBI agents officially investigating New York Representative George Santos in connection with an allegation raised by a Navy veteran who alleges Santos raised money for a sick service dog, but then that he received none of it. When asked by ABC, the embattled congressman denying any wrongdoing. Are you worried about being prosecuted? I have no clue. I don't know what it's about. Navy veteran Richard Ostoff accusing Santos of pocketing the $3,000 he raised on GoFundMe, which was intended to help Ostoff's dying service dog, Sapphire. But I was desperate and I needed help. Ostoff saying he was homeless when Sapphire developed a tumor that required surgery and that a veterinarian technician referred him to a pet charity run by Santos. ABC has reported IRS records don't list any charity under that name. Santos previously described the allegations as insane, reiterating he he doesn't know Ostoff. But he claimed he never met me, and I never met him. But a source close to GoFundMe confirmed that account belonged to Santos. This probe on top of others by federal prosecutors and the New York Attorney General. Sources saying they're both investigating this alleged charity scheme as well as Santos's campaign finances. And back in Queens today, angry constituents outside Santos's office calling for more oversight. I've written a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland calling for an immediate federal monitor to oversee his campaign fund. Santos adamant his name will be cleared. Santos said he would recuse himself from serving in House committees as he faces growing scrutiny. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said Santos would be removed from office if the House Ethics Committee finds he broke the law. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. In other headlines across America today, a twin baby that was kidnapped and later found has now died in Ohio. The five-month-old baby died this past Saturday in Columbus. Right now, a medical examiner is trying to determine why the child died. The same baby was kidnapped on December 19th, along with their twin, while the babies were in a running car. Their mother left that car running while she made a delivery as a DoorDash driver. A woman stole that car and took off with the babies, but police say they were found safe. The suspect in that case is now facing state and federal charges. A California judge says there is enough evidence against a utility company for its alleged part in the deadly Zog fire to face felony charges. California utility PG&E is charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter as well as charges for recklessly causing a fire that causes great bodily injury and arson during a state of emergency. According to Cal Fire, that September 2020 blaze was sparked by a tree falling on a PG&E power line. The massive wildfire burned more than 56,000 acres, destroyed more than 200 buildings, and was responsible for four deaths. Shipping containers lined up along the Arizona-Mexico border are on their way out. The federal government sued to bring those down. The former Arizona governor and feds came to an agreement, though, and all the containers are now being removed. Those containers were placed along the border to serve as a wall to deter migrants. For the past month, crews have been working to remove hundreds of containers that were put up just a few months ago. The containers will be moved to a site near the Tucson and Yuma jails. The taxpayer-funded project has cost nearly $140 million. Still to come, it's time to get your rodeo gear looking sharp, especially if you're going to be sporting a cowboy hat, or you can go if you need to step up that hat game. And a recall alert, what you need to look out for and what you should do if you have this product in your kitchen. 